<clears throat> All right, this is part three of Power in Place, Indian Education in America. We're on chapter six, the schizophrenic nature of Western metaphysics. <clears throat> In order to clearly distinguish what is val valuable in the old ways from the behavior we are expected to practice as members of the larger American society, American Indians must elaborate on our own indigenous systems of metaphysics and, and contrast, contrast them with the dominant metaphysics of Western civilization. Failure to deal with the... Pr with <laughs> Failure to deal with the problems of practices and values at their roots or foundation will result in serious confusion later. The best way to illustrate the fundamental difference between a Western metaphysics and an in end and indigenous North American metaphysics is to begin with the most vexing issue confronting Western influenced societies. The irreconcilable Oh, I can't speak. Oh, shit. Irreconcilable duality between facts and values. Most often discussed as the science versus religion conflict. We are flooded with media reports of conflicts daily. For example, the evolution controversy, human cloning, abortion, development of biological and nuclear weaponry, use of animals and medical research, product safety testing, and so on. What is the source of these conflicts? This chapter is called Experiential Metaphysics in the World. An American Indian response, I would agree, would identify the source of many of these conflicts in the failure of Western metaphysics to produce an integrated big picture of human experience in the world as opposed to a big picture of the world. The distinction between an indigenous metaphysics of human beings in the world versus a western metaphysics of the world is crucial the latter requires a level of abstraction between human experience while the former requires abstract concept formation in the service of experience the metaphysics of the world is nothing less than the transference and unconscious resurrection of the medieval god problem as the as the modern Western problem of the certainty of human knowledge. Hold on, I'm having some trouble here. Okay, should still be recording. As the modern Western problem of, a, of the certainty of human knowledge. Medieval scholastic philosophers successfully demonstrated through logic that God must be omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. In the 17th and 18th centuries, logic was of little use in addressing growing a doubt among Western intellectuals of the existence of God. Although logic was increasingly demonstrated as useful to humans in their attempt to control and use nature. Today, the irreconcilable, why is this so hard for me? irreconcilable conflict between meaning, values, and knowledge slash facts in Western metaphysics is obvious. This is clearly demonstrated in the, ability, in the inability of Western legal institutions to grasp American Indian and Alaska Native claims that some places on the planet possess a degree of sacredness that, pre that precludes treatment as real estate, private property, or public lands. Nowhere is the schizophrenic nature of Western metaphysics more obvious than in the current lack of religious freedom for many indigenous people in America. The poverty of religious freedom is evidenced in recent U.S. Supreme Court decisions that increasingly reduce religion to a set of deeply held beliefs unrelated to where people live and how they live. At the very moment, people around the world are awakened to the fact that our planet is one complex web of ecological systems resplendent with biological and cultural diversity. 
the group of people most representative of cultural and ethnic diversity in the United States, American Indians, and Alaska Natives, are implored to explain their widely shared understanding that the earth is sacred. It is ironic that the most diverse peoples of the Americas are now placed in a position where we are, where we are required to explain, document, and provide evidence for our spiritual and religious traditions in order to protect religious ceremonies and practices that ensure the very biological diversity that our, spirit, that our spiritual traditions rest on. This turn of events is not surprised given the dominant Western view that religion is not of this world. In other words, in other words natural but otherworldly supernatural phenomenon. Since long before the passage of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act in 1978, American Indians and Alaska Natives have been fighting to defend the notion, know the practical reality, that religious experiences are in a profound sense a part of the power that, that sits in places. We reject abstract theologies and metaphysical systems in the... <clears throat> And metaphysical systems in the place of experiential systems properly called indigenous or emergent from a place. What explains the tremendous divide between our experiential traditions and Western theological abstractions? Two very different metaphysical systems. Native systems, where explanation is often discussed in terms of experiential correspondence and understood as irreducible to simple mechanical causality versus the now dominant Western metaphysical system, where the logic and causality established by David Hume nearly three centuries ago mandates empirical gener generaliza generalizations of mechanical cause and effect relationships. This chapter is called The Problem with Descartes and Hume. Probably saying that wrong. Problem with Descartes. Descartes. The conflict between science and religion in the Western tradition is indicative of the schizophrenic nature of Western metaphysics. An American Indian metaphysics has, has the advantage of designating science and religion not as mutually exclusive realms of experience or areas of human interest, but as fundamental questions of knowledge and understanding found on a continuum of experience. It is not an overstatement to see the Descartes. Oh, I'm losing frames again. Hold on. Okay. But as a fundamental question of knowledge and understanding found on the continuum of experience, it is an, it is not an overstatement to see Descartes' deductive, even mathematical rationalism, and Hume's systematic empiricism as flip sides of the same coin. Both point to a world encountered by learned European minds as being without spirit or power in a tangible, phenomenal sense. Although Descartes, this this Cartes rationalism seems to emphasize the human mind, or as one modern philosopher philosopher remarked, see, place a ghost in the machine. This does not discount the basic point that his clear and distinct ideas are only appertained within a human mind that is understood as a logical machine. Teaching American Indian and Alaska Native students Descartes' meditation on first philosophy and discourse on method of rightly conducting reason and reaching and reaching the truth in the sciences is difficult because the problem he poses is foreign to the general metaphysical foundation of indigenous North American worldviews. To doubt one's own existence seems not only unreasonable but suggested but suggestive of serious illness within indigenous worldviews. The famous I think therefore I am is an ex post facto truism not only at the level of logic but at the level of experience too. That Descartes found it necessary to logically prove something that 
could be accepted by virtue of experience only indicates the extent to which experience in the world became increasingly problematic in the Western, for the Western psyche. Descartes' focus on subject-centered self-conscious awareness is interesting and peculiar. Subjective awareness and consciousness would seem a good bridge to an exploration of human experience in a broader context. However, what I will call Descartes' extreme logical interiorizing of awareness in his I think, therefore I am, precludes any such exploration. Existence in a Cartesian world view is so intellectual abstract relative to experience that we might suggest Descartes initiates a modern tradition of experience, of experiential agnosticism that is, experience as unknowable in, in Western thought. <clears throat> what may be even more amazing and ironic is that Hume's radically empiricist, empiricist version of human experience and existence produces a small agnostic view of experience, albeit from a completely opposite point of departure. Hume's response to the increasingly problematic nature of, a, of experience in the world was set out in a treaty, treatise of human nature and later in a reworking of part one of that work known as An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. <clears throat> Hume's notion that ultimately all knowledge comes from sense impressions results in his claim that causality is nothing more than a constant combination between perceived objects called cause, causes and effects. In fact, he consistently and quite radically claims that any so-called natural laws of causality are little more than empirical generalizations based on custom and habit. He denies there exists any necessary relation or connection between objects. Not surprisingly, Native students often remark that after Hume's inquiry, all that remains for certain are uncertain beliefs and no knowledge. <clears throat> Hume, Hume's inquiry is rightly recognized as the benchmark for modern skepticism. But from the standpoint of an American Indian metaphysics, Hume's thought is, it is fatally flawed by the reduction of experience to impressions of objects and their more vague relations. Not surprisingly, Hume's attitude toward God and miracles is skepticism, as both by definition within Hume's philosophical epistemology, system of knowledge, <clears throat> are outside the realm of knowledge, irre irreducible to impressions. If one reduces experience to impressions of objects, then much of what challenges our understanding in the world will be unintelligible. Hume demonstrated that empiricism and rationalism both result in reason skepticism, but to what end? The obvious point is that Hume's miracles confront him as nothing more than mysteries or events without, explaining, without explanation at the present time or beyond reason. It would indeed be an improvement if scientists t today read and understood Hume for at least one, for at least some modesty regarding their own knowledge claims would certainly ensue. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the part of Hume's thought that was most lasting was his simple construction of cause and effect and the reduction of all causal relationships to the constant conjunction of objects. These two ideas have certainly served the mechanics illustrated views of life well. The problem with 17th and 18th century rationalism and empiricism is that both left undeveloped, or one might even say avoided, the realm of experience and consequently the realm of power. An alternative to Hume's empiricism and, in, and inevitable skepticism and Descartes' rationalism is a reconstruction of American Indian metaphysics suggested by Deloria a reconstruction that overcomes the Western dualisms of knowledge versus belief and science versus religion. 
the difficult task for many of us first-generation academic intellectuals, Yuchi, Lakota, Salish, and otherwise, is to that the wisdom we want to explore is born of experience. In addition, for those traditional scholars or elders deeply imbued with this understanding, self-conscious discussion or analysis of their so-called metaphysical systems <clears throat> would be difficult at best and may rightly seem foolish or dangerous, possibly both. Fortunately, we academically, we academically trained native scholars have an advantage. If we avoid the traps of Western metaphysical schizophrenia, we can explore indigenous systems of thought by becoming attentive to how our traditional scholars or elders continue to live. The incredible gulf between Western and indigenous metaphysics is best summed up as follows. In the Western context, metaphysics became a study for philosophers. In indigenous communities, metaphysics would be understood as the basis for living, for living well, attentively, respectively, and responsibly in this world. This next chapter is called Religious Beliefs versus Scientific Knowledge. As we enter the 21st century, the fact that Native students are often confused by the question, what is the difference between knowledge and beliefs, is hopeful. For unlike many non-Indian students today, we think their beliefs, as such, excuse them from having any intelligible discussion in support of these beliefs or correspondence with reality. American Indians and Alaska Natives still seem to grasp that beliefs are most fundamentally about what we know and understand. A very good friend and scholar in the Western tradition, George Call, used to constantly say, faith is believing something you know ain't so, and religion is the problem. As a student of Western tradition, I understand his point, for if knowledge becomes reducible to materialistic mechanics, and those experiences and most deeply felt aspects of our existence are irreducible to such mechanical explanations, then religion, broadly understood as, encom as encompassing such aspects and experience of our existence, becomes a realm of faith, unknowable and unexplainable. <clears throat> Indigenous American Indian religions exist in independent of this metaphysical burden. While explain explainability seems necessary in, not in rationalist accountants of accounts of religion, it makes religion merely a large set of potentially infinite abstract logical systems. <clears throat> so, what one so what one begins to know about religion in the Western tradition is a philosophical system or theology. Faith becomes critical and necessary when one wants to know how these elaborate abstract systems correspond or operate in the world. For there exists within the dominant Western metaphysics no way of knowing, in other words, Descartes' doubt or Hume's skepticism. <clears throat> Descartes. <clears throat> American Indian, essentially tribal, religious traditions offer a stark contrast to the metaphysical schizophrenia submerged deep in the Western tradition. <clears throat> First, First, rationalist explanation in unnecessary is unnecessary if one depends on experience. This does not make the discussion of religion easy. It merely suggests that what we can discuss is limited not just by tribal tradition, but by its very nature, reality. Indigenous people might agree with Hume, although for much different reasons that the most meaningful aspects of religion are unexplainable by either the rationalist or the empiricist, empiricist mandates of Western metaphysics. However, in the continuum of experience, indigenous people depend on experiential verification, not logical proof. It is not the least bit personally or communal, communally troubling to indigenous peoples that all of our human experiences essentially religious experiences, are not reducible to objects or logic. William James, 
William James's The Varieties of Religious Experience debunked what he called medical materialism over a century ago, and his basic critique of scientific explanations of religious experiences still holds up. <clears throat> Experience remains the unexplored metaphysical terrain of the 21st century, and it is likely that the best scouts will be Indians, not by virtue of superior intellect, as commonly understood, but simply because there remains among many of us a predisposition to live in the world as opposed to living on, above, or in control of the world. Sam Deloria gave an excellent illustration of the fundamental difference in Western and indigenous worldviews during a presentation at Haskell Indian Nations University. He commented that one of the difficulties in having our traditional elders testify before Congress on issues relating to religion or religious freedom was the immediate miscommunication that ensued. <clears throat> When asked by committee members to speak about their religion, elders were not, would often respond by telling committee members that they did not have a religion. They were absolutely right, but their stance was predictably confusing to congressional committee members, who were in no position to understand what our traditional scholars and spiritual leaders were telling them. Osage theologian George Tinker summarized the basis for this communication problem quite well. <clears throat> Most adherents of traditional American Indian ways characteristically deny that their people ever engaged in any religion at all. Rather, these spokespersons insist their whole culture and social structure was and still is infused with a spirituality that cannot be separated from the rest of the community's life at any point. Whereas outsiders may identify a single religion, a single ritual, as the religion of a particular people. The people themselves will likely see the ceremony as merely an extension of their day-to-day -day experience, all parts of which are expressed within ceremonial parameters and shall be seen as religious. The sacredness of life was felt, acknowledged, and expressed throughout one's activities in the world. It is difficult to say exactly why experience in the world became so frightful to civilized Western humankind. God is Red made a good case. The problems ensued shortly after the life of Jesus was no longer seen as the life of a single community member in a very specific place on the planet, but as the outline for an abstract, worldwide, theology-based religion. But other events seem to have played a role too. <clears throat> including rapid technological advancement, development of the modern nation-state, or re-emergence thereof, and incredible social and biological catastrophe in the 15th century. It seems plausible that Kirkpatrick sells judgment in, uh, in the, the conquest of paradise of the voyages of Cristobal Colon may be right. Columbus was not so much trying to discover a new land, but escape, but es escape a declining, chaos-ridden old land. <clears throat> the distrust of experience is nowhere more evident, as we have seen, than in many philosophy of Descartes, who logically introduces God as a kind of insurance policy for reality. And the fear of experience in the world may have been the motive for a greatly diminished conception of experience in Locke's and Hume's empiricism. Nevertheless, Descartes' rationalism offers little hope of resolving the dual personality of Western metaphysics. As abstract logic affords establishment of as many gods as human beings can think up, humankind may indeed have a gift of thinking things up. Creativity, imagination, and inventiveness but human societies and the Earth's ecosystem seem threatened by a human creativity and imagination that has literally and figuratively lost touch with the Earth. <clears throat> My friend George Call came to believe late in life that science also had a share of the problem he used to describe to religion. If faith is believing things you know, you know ain't so, a good number of scientists are guilty. 
the silence of the sciences about the most pressing problems of our world today is indicative of the schizophrenic of the schizophrenic nature of the metaphysics underlying much of their modern practices. The Scrotis is rationalism and Hume's empiricism are flip sides of the same coin, a worldview in which humans presume themselves to be the measures of all things. Unfortunately, neither tackles the real question. So what of humankind? What of this unit of measure, so to speak? The problem with Western science, both rationalist and empiricist denominations, reminds me of what the great pitcher Satchel Page told a young player seeking advice. To paraphrase, remember, it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know that just ain't so that causes problems. This is Chapter 7, Traditional Technology. <clears throat> Education today is wholly oriented towards science and secul secul secularism. secularism. At the core of every curriculum is the belief that we can look at phenomena with a completely rational and objective eye and find abstract principles underlying all behavior, from atoms to masses of people. This perspective implies, of course, that the natural world and its inhabitants are completely materialistic, and that even the most profound sentiments can be understood as electrical impulses in the brain or as certain or as certain kinds of chemical reactions. We have arrived at this state of affairs through the application of methodological, methodo, methodology of reductionism, a tendency to divide, subdivide, and subdivide again in order to find the constitutes of an entity or event. The reductionist view of the world is further enhanced by the spectacular success of modern technology. Natural forces are being brought, up, being brought under human control, and cosmic energies bring us both power and entertainment. If a person were to chart out the relationships of the various academic disciplines, in resulting outline might find metaphysics and mathematics as co-equal partners at the top of pyramid of knowledge with chemistry, biology, psychology, and eventually the humanities as imperfect subsets or special cases of the application of physics to selected phenomena. This outline has dominated most of this century, but recent theoretical developments are now being beginning to call this simplistic perspective to account. The Gaia hypothesis, among other theories, suggests that we should bring we should begin to look at things organically and that we might indeed be a minor episode in a larger scheme of life. <clears throat> Whether this hypothesis proves faith fruitful enough to become a dominant paradigm in the social-slash-scientific future is beside the point. The issue today is that we no longer bound to use mecha mechanistic models exclusively to tell us how to think about the world. <clears throat> the knowledge and technology of tribal peoples, primitive peoples, and ancient humans does not really appear in the modern scientific scheme, unless it is to be found within the minor articulations of the concept of cultural evolution hidden in the backwards, in the backwaters of, an of anthropology, sociology, and history. This knowledge that served our ancestors so well emerges from time to time when modern scientists advocate a novel interpretation of data and in order to claim some historical roots for their ideas, as new ideas are forbidden in academia, ancient or tribal peoples are cited as societies who once used certain practices or held certain beliefs. But the presentation of the ideas is usually accompanied by the patronizing view that although tribals and primitives did originate the idea or the practice, they could not have possibly understood its significance. What would be some of the aspects of traditional technology? 
foremost would be establishing relationships with the larger cosmic rhythms and following those cycles. It is not simply correlation, correlating the group of the growth of corn with the maturing of mountain plants as earlier mentioned. The, the Tohono O'odham regularly regulated their harvest of desert plants according to the passage of star formations so that other creatures could use the desert plants when it was best for them. <clears throat> humans standing aside while they did so, after which humans could harvest what they needed. Technology would be burning of woods and grasses to ensure proper growth and, el and elimination of the buildup of undergrowth that would cause catastrophic fires. Traditional technology involved knowing when to harvest plants and how to approach them. Sand cherries would be sour if picked when the wind was blowing from, from humans to plants and sweet when it blew from plants to humans. Immense knowledge of horses was possessed by many tribes. An old tradition says that the Nez Perce create, create, created the Appaloosa by putting mud compacts on pregnant mares where they wanted spots to be on the, on the colts when they were born. Bows made from different kinds of wood produced different effects, and consequently people had to wait until the different woods could be harvested for bows. Teas and poultices made from herbs had to be harvested at the right time, or they would not have the proper potency. Watching birds approach and use trees and shrubs enabled people to learn the correct time for harvesting. Medicine rocks abounded and certain kinds of crystals were used for divining future events. Watching how animals related to each other often showed the best ways to approach various animals. Almost everything in nature gave lessons on how, to, on how the human should most profitably live. Indian students who come from traditional homes have considerable difficulty assimilating the practices and beliefs they learned as children with the modernist attitude of science. And for Indian students who grew up in urban areas and whose experience in reservation communities is limited, is limited to sporadic summertime visits, an even greater difficulty in assimilating this attitude exists. These students often believe certain things about tribal knowledge and techniques as a matter of faith because their experiences are very limited. But they want to recapture as much knowledge of their own tribal past and practices as possible. So the problem becomes an emotional as well as intellectual dilemma. A good deal of the... Hold on, give me a second. 32, okay. So that... A good deal of traditional knowledge was placed in a family context so that it was not difficult to, difficult to remember. Thus animals and plants were believed to not simply to be not simply peoples but family within that peoplehood. <clears throat> it was therefore possible to establish intimate relationships with specific plants and animals and gain precise knowledge that they possessed about the world. Although much of that knowledge has been lost with the confinement of our peoples to smaller reservations, it is still possible for the next generation of Indians to regain much information that we once had. Through precise observation and through ceremonies, we can once again connect the lives and minds of the other entities of the creation. Today, numerous new studies su suggest that many species have their own languages. <clears throat> Birds, prairie dogs, beavers, bears, and others are now given credit for having a substantial mental and emotional life. One might even project that they have their own philosophies as we have ours. It would be foolish to deny that, po that, possibly, that possibility when purchasing tapes of whale songs at our local New Age store. <clears throat> now... These creatures often spoke to our grandparents in our language and also taught them some of their language. Imitating birds and animals was not simply an entertainment talent, but spoke of the, intimate, the intimacy of organic life in a way that Western science may take decades to understand. 
So at many points where the West relies on doctrinal exp explanations, traditional Indian knowledge can provide both ideas and data to bridge the gulf and expand human understanding. <clears throat> This next chapter is called, cre or not chapter, this next paragraph is called Creation Stories. If one should track backward into the past of most tribal groups to find how things originated, one would quickly discover that specific instructions were given to the old people regarding plants, animals, birds, and reptiles, and stones, as well as the technology for living in the community with them. <clears throat> These instructions came in dreams, visions, and unusual incidents, and more than not, and often more than not, the relationship with plants and animals was a result of interspecies communications. The primary focus of creation stories of many tribes placed human beings as among the as among the last creatures who were created, and as the youngest of the living families. We were given the ability to the ability to do many things but not specific wisdom about the world so our job was to learn from other older beings and to pattern ourselves after their behavior <clears throat> we were to gather knowledge not dispense it western science really traces itself backward to the garden of eden scenario in which humans are also last created but it is believed that they are given mastery over the rest of the world. Humans are, in the Western scheme of things, the source of knowledge and information, but they are also iso isolated from the rest of creation by standing alone at the top of the pyramid. <clears throat> because we gather knowledge from older beings who have the wisdom of the world within their grasp, we must maintain a relationship with the rest of creation. Consequently, the clan and kinship systems that guided the social organization of the world were not only modeled after observed behavior of other beings, but also sought to preserve the idea of relationships of the natural world within the technology that arose as a result of our learning experiences. <clears throat> Western science learned its lessons from observation and then from experimentation with the entities of the natural world. There was no sense of community because humans had been placed too far above the rest of creation and there was no hesitancy among western people to use the rest of creation in any manner it could conceive <clears throat> but the price of using others as objects was that absolute values had to be maintained and space time and matter became absolute concepts within western science both science and its reductionist methods remained absolute as long as these ideas were, were regarded as absolute. In a fundamental sense, which many people in science do not, do not yet recognize, the theories of Albert Einstein created tremendous gaps in the Western scientific scheme. Einstein's work challenged the absolute status of space, time, and matter and his major contribution was to reduce the absolute nature of these ideas to a relative status. He introduced the concept, the context, into modern science in a way that could not easily be refuted. But the importance of relativity for traditional thinking is that it began to shift the focus from absolute materialistic framework science had constructed to an idea that things are related. Not many people in the academic community have yet applied this idea to the world as a totality, and certainly many of them could rebel at the idea that science is shifting significantly toward a tribal understanding of the world. They continue to believe that relativity means that there are no absolutes. In fact, <clears throat> It means that things are related in some fundamental ways that had, uh, had previously been excluded. There may not be as many anomalies and coincidences as we have previously supposed. Many tribes described relationships in terms of correspondence between two things ordinarily thought to be distinct, isolated, or unrelated. The old saying in religious ceremonies, as above so it is on earth, is such a correspondence so it is the gathering of things for equipping medicine bags for making drums weapons household goods and clothing 
and for creating altars and blessing dwellings and blessing dwellings. <clears throat> In each of these activities, a variety of materials are used, and they are said to represent certain things. Represent here is not taken as a symbolic gesture, but usually to mean that the power and knowledge of these things are actually present in the creation of something new. This paragraph is called Wisdom and Vision, Acknowledging the Life and Power in All Things. <clears throat> Today we have the artifacts of every tribe lining the shelves of museums and being described as great primitive art. And indeed, if we think of these artifacts only as useful utensils and implements apart from the tribal context, they may be simple instruments, extensions of the people's limbs and desires, as Robert Ardre once, once, um, once edified describing weapons and tools. <clears throat> The important part of the relationship, however, was that things were alive, and consequently, their own power and wisdom was incorporated with them, wherever they were, wherever they were represented. Modern humans use weapons, tools, and instruments to extend the, the capabilities of their own selves, and they use these things mechanically. Tribal people, in using their instruments, did not simply extend the scope of their own capabilities, but enhanced their abilities through the addition of the powers inherent in the relationships they had with other living things. <clears throat> Today we attend colleges and universities in order to learn the principles of how, of how things work and how to use instruments properly. Tribal peoples learn these things in religious ceremonies, depending on the intensity and scope of the vision a person received, a, or the frequency with which spirits informed him or her concerning the proper attitude to take when exercising certain powers. Thus, it was a holistic understanding that undergirded tribal technology, and use of the technology was vision-specific. <clears throat> That is to say, the knowledge the old ones attached their own technology demanded that they use the powers sparingly and on proper occasions. A person could not indiscriminately use powers as we causally use our instruments today, casually, as we casually use our instruments today. <clears throat> This lesson is important because today with modern technology, we tend to believe that we can apply it on a rather indiscriminate basis, and we are learning that often we do not really understand the side effects such as such use creates. <clears throat> the old anthropology and history of religious schools used to paint tribal peoples as a superstitious lot who cringed in fear of the natural of the natural elements and made up simplistic explanations for all things they did not understand in an effort to create some kind of science for themselves. Modern science tends to use two kinds of questions to examine the world. One, how does it work? And two, what use is it? These questions are natural for the people who think the world is constructed to serve their purposes. The old people might have used two questions in their effort to understand the world, but it is certain that they always asked an additional question. What does it mean? This, uh, this paragraph is called Healing the Lack of Balance. <clears throat> the old people surveying a landscape had such a familiarity with the world that they could immediately see what was not in, in its place. If they, if they discerned anything that seemed to be out of its natural order, a nocturnal animal in the daytime, unusual clouds or weather conditions, or a change of the plants, they went to work immediately to discover what this change meant. <clears throat> Many observers have said that this ability to perceive anomalies meant that people could see when nature was out of balance. And I certainly would not quarrel with this characterization. <clears throat> when people saw an imbalance, their understanding of the natural ordering of cosmic energies informed them that their responsibility was to initiate ceremonies that would help bring about balance once again. 
Eventually, it was recognized that the, that the world had a moral being and that disruptions around human societies created disharmony in the rest of the world. This belief corresponded to modern professional ethics, but differed from them ethics, but differed from them in that the whole tribal society was involved in healing the lack of balance. Today, it is the only it is only the professional who sees the imbalance. And the general society comes to believe that the scientists can create the technology needed to bring balance back again. Thus, in spite of a clearly deteriorating deteriorating physical world brought about by industrial industrial society we still think in mechanical technological terms when we discuss restoration of what we have disrupted because no one actually sees quantum waves what is quantum physics except scientific mysticism except scientific mysticism <clears throat> Traditional technology may seem outdated to many Indian students now undertaking a scientific education. If so, they are not getting the full story from historians and apologists of science. It is said that Albert Einstein had holistic and sometimes substantial, vi substantial visions of the world, and that he spent most of his life looking for the proper mathematics to describe what he had experienced. One need only look at the many instances in which noted scientists had visions or dreams that solved the problem they were confronting. The world in which we live, at its very foundations, is unified and cannot be reduced by techniques, by techniques and rationality. Where traditional Indians and modern science are quite different is in what they do with their knowledge after they have obtained it. Traditional people preserve the whole vision, and scientists generally reduce the experience to its alleged constitute parts and inherit principles. These principles then become orthodoxy and stumbling blocks to future generations. A great gulf exists between these two ways of handling knowledge. Science forces secrets from nature by experimentation, and the results of the experiments are thought to be knowledge. The traditional peoples accepted secrets from the rest of, rest of creation. Science leaves anomalies. Whereas the unexplained in traditional technology is held as mystery, accepted, revered, and often discarded as useless. Science operates in fits and starts because the anomalies of one generation often become the orthodoxy of the next generation. Witness the continental drift theories, catastrophism, and fictional theories about the Bering Strait. This paragraph is called Giving Traditional Technology a Careful Look. Indian students would do well to understand the traditional approach to learning about the world in addition to taking the scientific courses to gain entrance to professions. They should be prepared in their work as students and later as professional people to answer the question, what does it mean? In addition to answering any other questions that as professional people, they will be expected to answer. Traditional technology can be extremely useful because it always reminds us that we take our cue about the world from the experiences and evidence that the world gives us. We may elicit and force secrets from nature, but nature is only answering the specific question we ask. It is not given us the whole story as it would f as it would if it were specifically involved in the communication of knowledge. <clears throat> what is given willingly is much more valuable than it was than what is demanded as a matter of force because many Indian students will be working for their tribes once they receive their professional degrees, it would benefit them to give techno traditional technology a careful look. Tribal lands and resources have always been used on a sustained yield basis, and this attitude is in distinct contrast to the American propensity to exhaust resources for short-term gains. Modern technology Modern technology might indeed be useful in repairing the damages already done to tribal lands, 
so that the lambs can once again be put on a traditional use pattern and become productive. And even this possibility can be learned from the world as it responds to ceremonies and human societies who understand their place in the larger cosmos. As science progresses, so do, so do the ceremonies. And as we look ahead, there is considerable, considerably more to be obtained, to be gained by combining insights than by ignoring them. Okay, we're in chapter 8. Technological Homelessness A United States is a nation of homeless people. A modest ex estimate would place three-fourths of U.S. citizens in a condition of homelessness, a technology-induced condition of homelessness. I am not talking about the desperate situation of the far too many Americans without any real means to provide for a domicile or residence within, with a definite address. <clears throat> These individuals and family and families have real problems through their lacking of lack of housing, ironically, might be straightforwardly addressed and solved to a great extent given a little moral little moral courage courage and political will. <clears throat> no. The problem of homelessness demanding attention concerns the vast majority of Americans today in living houses, condos, apartments, and residences with addresses, who have taken advantage of our society's modern education systems and technologies and still feel lost, disconnected, ungrounded, or what we call homeless. <clears throat> By homeless, I mean without a home as the American Indian, I mean, American Heritage Dictionary secondly defines home, an environment or haven of shelter, of happiness, and love. In industrial and post-industrial societies, human beings, especially in U.S. suburbs, live less in shelters than bunkers, strategic enclaves where they do not so much live as primarily sleep. Happiness and sleep among those with means in America are only a pharmaceutical prescription away, and for those without means, happiness is predictably defined by success in attaining the material wealth a great many of the unhappy with means possess. As for love, the line of a popular song states, what's love got to do with it? As it turns out for many, very little. It is disturbing to have a point, it is, it is disturbing, disturbing to have to point these facts out especially because we are surrounded by them daily. Alex de Tocqueville, almost two centuries ago, feared for democracy in America because he saw Americans so preoccupied with material success that they did little time for participation in democracy. Only three decades after Tocqueville's assessment, Suquamish leader S Seattle noted that human beings seem to have lost the knowledge of how to live. By the middle of the 19th century, Americans were already in a struggle for survival. The irony is obvious. We have learned more about the manipulation of the physical or material elements of the world for our human, for our human comfort and convenience. And yet, American workers are experiencing increasing rates of anxiety, depression, and stress. Not surprisingly, in the last decade, American workers have surpassed the, ja the Japanese in in time spent working. The United States is now the longest working ad advanced industrial nation in the world. The, econ the economy may be good for some or even many, but good for what? Or good at what? The answer is simple, making money. It is often quoted that after the successful detonation of the atomic bomb, the preeminent example of technological achievement in the scientist in the scientific worldview, Einstein lamented that everything had changed but the way humans think. There is nothing new in the judgment that the industrialization and manufacturing and manufacture have disproportionately benefited a new financial financially. 
and in terms of material comfort and convenience benefited many, although inequitably. And at what cost to ourselves and our ecological communities? Indices and, and rates of mental illness are all up, especially when, when one includes those illnesses labeled neurosis. Ironically, it appears we may have bought more with the materialist mantra of comfort than we bargained for, a significant amount of discomfort to our spirits. In the Western tradition, the critique of industrialism Industrialization has largely been over the control and management of the system of production and consequently the distribution of the industrial economy's benefits. Apart from a neglected anarch anarchist moral critique and a recent strain of criticism referred to as Leo Ludism, only a few have questioned the overall effects of technology on the human condition and on how we live and what it means to be a human being. I wish all young Indian students would read Stan, Stan Steiner's The New Indians. It documents a history too few Indian students today know. They should at least read the foreword, in which Steiner recounts the following incident. In the 1960s, Vine Deloria Jr. was invited to a civil rights fundraiser to see how things were done. As the event was winding down, the topic of red power was raised, and featured keynote speaker, and the featured keynote speaker laughed and quickly dismissed the notion, to which Deloria replied, Red power will win. We are no longer fighting for physical survival. We are fighting for ideological survival. Our ideas will overcome your ideas. We are going to cut the country's whole value system to shreds. It isn't important that there are only 500,000 of us Indians. What is important is that we have a superior way of life. We Indians have a more human philosophy of life. We Indians will show this country how to act human. Someday this country will revise its constitution, its laws, in terms of human beings instead of property. If red power is to be a power in this country, it is because it is ideological. When told again that Indians should be fighting for equality and civil rights, not red power, Deloria continued, We do, but that isn't the question. The question is, what is the nature of life? It isn't what you eat or whether you eat or who you vote for or whether you vote or not. What is the ultimate value of a man's life? That is the question. To linear thinkers, the, the above statements may seem out of place in a discussion of technology, but they are the most fundamental questions to be considered as we think of the development and use of technology. To our ultimate end, or purpose, are these tools. Education today must now undertake a serious examination of these questions, and there is no better place to begin than classrooms in American Indian communities. <clears throat> Here, there still exists an experiential metaphysics and worldview that approaches technology as essentially a question of nature and how we, be, and how we human beings live with and in nature. For the sake of clarification, I submit that two very different understandings of technology are the issue. A deeply seated, metaphysically based, Western view of technology as science applied to industrial manufacture and commercial objectives versus a metaphysically based American Indian or rather indigenous view of technology as practices and tool making to enhance our living and with nature. The Western conception and practices of technology are bound in and in bound up in essentially human centered materialism. The doctrine that physical well-being and world-possessed constitutes the greater good and highest value in life. Indigenous conceptions and practices of technology are embedded in a way of living that is inclusive of spiritual, physical, emotional, and intellectual dimensions emergent in the world, or, more accurately, particular places in the world. 
we cannot afford to ma to minimize or soft shell the soft sell the situation in which we find ourselves. The problems we most likely and certainly our children and grandchildren will face are monumental. Environmental degradation, technological imperialism, consumerism for consumerism sake, sake what Thorstein Velbin called conspicuous consumerism, consumption, conspicuous consumption, and increasing social dysfunction. Yet, there is reason to be cautiously optimistic because we literally reached a place, or I should say places, in the modern world where the plethora of problems that surround us are rising to level where they cannot be ignored. Okay, that's where we're going to stop today. We're on page 70, bottom of page 70. All right, I'll start up again tomorrow.